Hello everyone and welcome to Data Science Dojo's live tutorial on introductory data visualization with R and ggplot2. My name is Blair Heckel and I am the marketing manager here at Data Science Dojo and I will be moderating today's webinar. Before we begin the webinar, I would like to mention that all lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar, but questions are encouraged. To ask a question, use the questions module on the right side of your screen. Moving on to today's agenda, I will provide a brief introduction to our speaker today, Dave Langer. Dave will then jump right into the presentation, including the use of R code. We will save time at the end of the webinar to answer questions. In the event that we do not have enough time to answer all questions, feel free to post any questions that you have on the meetup.com page for this webinar, and Dave will be happy to answer them. We ask that you please participate, as this will allow us to bring you other interesting tutorials in the data science field. Lastly, if you are interested in following along with the presentation, both the slides and R code are available via GitHub at the URL you see here. The URL is also available via the meetup.com page for this webinar. Our presenter today is Dave Langer, Vice President of Data Science at Data Science Dojo. Dave has trained hundreds of working professionals via Data Science Dojo's unique five-day bootcamp format and has trained thousands more via his YouTube tutorials. Prior to joining Data Science Dojo, Dave worked at Microsoft where he led a technical program management team accountable for all the data systems used to run Microsoft's $10 billion supply chain operations. Dave joined Data Science Dojo to realize the company's miss mission of data science for everyone. It is Dave's belief that you do not need a PhD in statistics or machine learning to learn data science and apply it to your daily work to derive business value. Dave has experience across numerous analytical technologies and techniques, but his current focus areas are text analytics, event log mining, and mathematical programming. Dave's true passion, however, is teaching others data science. Feel free to connect with Dave via LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter if he can be of help in your data science journey. Dave, welcome to this Data Science Dojo webinar. Thank you, Blair, for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to everyone about ggplot2, a subject that I am particularly excited about and something I teach all of our students about in our Data Science Dojo boot camps. Okay, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about expectation setting. I like to do this with each of my meetups or each of my webinars or each of my tutorials just so that you know what to expect from the time that you invest in this presentation. So first up, I'm going to assume the following. I'm going to assume that you are experienced with R coding. I'm not going to assume that you're an expert, but I'm going to assume that you can hack, that you can understand R code when you see it. Because we don't have a lot of time at our disposal, so we're going to focus mainly on how to work with ggplot2 and not so much about R syntax. Next up, I'm going to assume that you have some data visualization knowledge. For example, what is a histogram? Or what is a box and whisker plot? We're not going to talk a little, we're not going to talk about the actual visualizations themselves. We're going to focus more on how to use ggplot2 to create those visualizations. Lastly, and probably most importantly, I'm going to assume that you're interested in how you can use ggplot2 to accelerate and improve your data visualizations in your day-to-day -day work as a data professional. So out of necessity, because this is a limited time that we have together, uh, this is just going to be a quick intro to visualization with ggplot2. So as a consequence, I'm going to have to gloss over a lot of things. For example, in ggplot2, you can actually create very rich, layered visualizations with actually multiple layers of things going on all at the same time. Unfortunately, this is a, an advanced topic, and we won't have time to talk about it today. But we will have time to talk about is the 20% 20, 20 of ggplot2 that is useful 80% of the time. We're really going to use the 80-20 rule here to talk about ggplot2 and focus on the kinds of visualizations and the kinds of questions that you want to answer using ggplot2. If you get interested in ggplot2, and I hope that you will, uh, I will provide resources later in the deck for you to learn more. More in-depth resources to get better with ggplot2 to answer all kinds of different types of business questions that you may have. Overall, my goal, though, is to make you excited about ggplot2. I, I'm a big fan of ggplot2. I use it every day in my work. I teach it in every single one of our boot camps to our students at Data Science Dojo. It is a wildly, wildly useful tool as a data professional, as a data scientist. Okay. So, as Blair mentioned, I, I used to work at Microsoft before coming to Data Science Dojo, and I, I spent a number of years as a program manager. So, 
I've learned to look at the world in terms of scenarios and personas, and this presentation will be no different. We'll use a scenario to create a frame of reference for understanding the data that we're looking at, why we're looking at the data, the kinds of business questions that we can formulate over that data, and the visualizations that we use to help us answer those questions. But before we dive into the scenario, we need to talk a little bit about the prerequisites. If you wish to follow along, either during this presentation or after the fact, you're going to need the following. You're going to need R, and you are going to need R Studio. Now, strictly speaking, R Studio is optional. You absolutely have to have the R programming language, of course, but R Studio is an optional add-on. I would highly recommend that you use R Studio. I will be doing the entire demo in R Studio, and I always recommend to folks that they use R Studio because it does make your R coding experience a lot more productive and a lot more enjoyable. Next up, of course, you're also going to need the ggplot2 package installed in your R environment. All the code that we will be using today is going to be uh, leveraging ggplot2, so you absolutely have to have that package installed. And lastly, as Blair mentioned earlier, the GitHub repository for this webinar has the source file, it has the data file, and it also has the PDF of all these slides. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the data. So the first question you may ask is, why use this data set? And the data set in question that we use is the Kaggle Competition's Titanic Machine Learning from Disaster data set. Now, if you've seen any of our data science dojo meetups or presentations or webinars, you know that we use this data set extensively. And we do this for two primary reasons. One, everyone is familiar with the prop domain. I've literally asked this question to hundreds of people. Essentially, I say, how many of you are not familiar with the Titanic, what happened on the Titanic, the, the story of the Titanic? Raise your hands. And universally, nobody raises their hand. So everyone's familiar with the problem domain. And this is important because when we do these tutorials, when we do these webinars, when we do these meetups, we have lots and lots of different folks with lots of different backgrounds from different industries, so on and so forth. So using a particular data set from a particular problem domain uh, can be problematic with that diverse of an audience. But everyone is familiar with what happened on the Titanic. So it's part of the reason why we use it. It's super important. Next up, Believe it or not, the actual Titanic data set that you can get from Kaggle is actually a good proxy for common business data. For example, it is a good proxy for customer profile data. That is, the kinds of things that you see in the Titanic data set, the nature of the data, the fact that it's not 100% clean, the fact that it has overloaded uh, data columns in terms of meaning, is actually highly representative of the kinds of things that you see in the business world. For example, if you were going to pull customer profile data, for example, to build a predictive, predictive model for understanding whether or not a customer is going to churn, going to leave your company to go to a competitor, you would go to your data warehouse, you'd go to your data mart, you'd pull the cus your customer profile data. A lot of the characteristics in that data match what you see in the Titanic data set. So it is extremely useful for precisely that reason. So to, to, uh, to illustrate that, we can go over the data dictionary for the Titanic data set. And what you can see here is the data dictionary. And down this list of column, this column here, we have all the variables, all the columns in the data frame that are available in the Titanic data. So first up, we have a variable called survived. And it defines survival, essentially. It's a binary indicator. It's zero when a passenger in the Titanic did not make it, that they perished. And it's a one if they actually survived. Next up, we have the ticket class, or P class. Now, the way to think about this in modern times is trains. You can buy a first class ticket on a train, a second class ticket on a train, or a third class ticket on a train. All of these, all of these, these are um, designations of the level of accommodations that you have on the train. In a similar fashion, on the Titanic, you also had first class tickets, second class tickets, third class tickets that defined your accommodation on the boat. Next up, we have an indicator of gender, the sex variable. It's going to be male or female. We also have a variable in the data set for age. This is a continuous variable. It's a numeric column. It has decimal points in it. So for example, you'll see ages of you know 33.44 years, that sort of thing. And the next up, we have two variables called sibspa and parch. And the reason why these are interesting is because what I mentioned on the previous slide, which is Oftentimes in 
well-established business systems that you would work with as an analyst or a data scientist, certain data fields get overloaded. In database terms, certain columns on tables get overloaded over time. People say, hey, I want to add a new aspect of my business process, but I don't have the time to actually go through and modify the computer systems or the databases. Hey, there's this this there's this data this data value over here. I can overload it. So sometimes it means this and sometimes it means that. Happens all the time in modern business systems. And this is what we actually have here in this SIBSPA and parch variables. The first one is overloaded. It is the count of the number of siblings and or whether or not you're traveling with, with a spouse. Notice how it's overloaded. It could either be just the number of brothers and sisters that you're traveling with, or it could be your spouse, or it could be the combination of siblings and your spouse that you're traveling with. Next up, we have parch. Similarly, parch is overloaded. It is the count of the number of parents or the number of children that you'll be traveling with aboard the Titanic. Again, notice how it's overloaded, and or, and or. So these two are very indicative of the kinds of things that you see in the real world. Next up, we have ticket, which is just the serial number of your ticket on the Titanic. We have fare, how much you paid for your ticket in pounds sterling. Next up, we have cabin. Not every, not every passenger on the Titanic actually had a cabin number, but if you did have a cabin number assigned to you, you would be listed here. And then lastly, there's a column that denotes where you got on the ship, your port of embarkation. C for Cherbourg, Q for Queenstown, and S for Southampton. And the reason why we're going through this data is to level set everybody on the webinar today about the data set, because this is going to be super important, because understanding these columns and what they mean are critical for actually saying, I have this type of business question, I would like to create a visualization that potentially answers that question. So you need to know what pieces of data to use in that visualization. Okay, so now we're familiar with the data set, we can talk about our scenario. So we are a consulting data scientist. This is our hypothetical scenario. So we're a consulting data scientist and we've been hired by a company to analyze the Titanic data set. Let's say it's the, the, the Starline company that actually ran, uh, the, the, ran the actual shipping line. Okay. In particular, the goal of our analysis is to explain patterns of survival in the data. The business folks that have hired us as the consultant want to know hey, who survived and who died and why? Explain to me the patterns in the data that determine survival. And here's the thing to note, and this is super important. The audience is decidedly non-data savvy. And this is actually very common. While this is a contrived scenario, in fact, the scenario has very, very many real world analogs. It's very common for consultants to be hired, not to be necessarily familiar with the problem domain, and try to create uh, an understanding of what's going on in the data and explain it to an audience that may not necessarily be data savvy. So there's many analogs in the real world. Customer churn, fraud detection, if you're an e-commerce site, understanding conversion rates, all those sorts of things mimic this scenario and also mimic what we'll see in our analysis of the data and the tools and techniques that we use like ggplot2 and the visualizations that we use to actually understand what's going on in the data. Now here's the critical thing. Because our audience is decidedly non-data savvy, we probably shouldn't lead the presentation of our findings with things like summary statistics or any sort of complicated mathematical representations of the data. Ideally, what we should be using is intuitive visualizations that leverage the power of the human brain to do pattern recognition visually to allow us to tell our story in a much more intuitive fashion. So using the power of ggplot2, we will do precisely this as we walk through the R code. Okay, so that's our scenario. That's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to achieve. Let's now start talking a little bit about ggplot2. Okay, if you fire up our studio and you type in a command into R to say, look, show me the help file for the ggplot2 package, this is what you'll see. This is what you'll see. Create elegant data visualizations using the grammar of graphics. Not surprisingly, the grammar of graphics, or GG, is where the GG and ggplot2 comes from. Now, ggplot2 has become the de facto standard visualization tool in R. And to illustrate the point, you are probably like me. You probably have various social media feeds, whether that's Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook. And if you're interested in data science topics, you'll get a 
daily feed of LinkedIn posts and articles or articles on Facebook or tweets, what have you, all regarding data science. And usually what they'll have is in the feed is a graphic to go along with the teaser text to get you to click on it if you're interested. Invariably, at least once a day and often many times a day, I see visualizations in those, gra in those graphics in that feed that are obviously coming from ggplot2. And, that, and the reason why I bring that up is it shows you how ubiquitous ggplot2 is in the data science community. R is pretty ubiquitous, and people who use R tend to also use ggplot2. So this is, a, this is a very, very valuable tool for you to have in your tool belt as a data professional using R. Now, the reason why arguably it's become the de facto standard is because ggplot2 was designed from the ground up to allow you as an R coder to create print quality graphics literally in seconds. It takes very, very few keystrokes in R to actually produce a high quality graphic suitable for printing in a magazine or an academic journal or anything else that you can think of. And in particular, what also makes ggplot2 extremely, um, extremely important and extremely well, um, extremely widely used in R is not only the fact that it makes you productive, you can create these visualizations in seconds, but if you need to, you can exhibit very fine-grained control. Very fine-grained control. Specifically, there is a collection of functions, an API or application programming interface that ggplot2 provides that manifests the grammar. And what this allows you to do is to write your R code using the ggplot2 library in such a way that you essentially have fine-grained custom control over the way the, the images look by layering on various aspects of this visual grammar to eventually result in this graphic that you would like to have. And this is super powerful. Now, the thing I need to caution, though, is that the next slide in particular, you may think, oh, man, ggplot2 is extremely complicated. I see fine-grained control. Dave's talking about fine-grained control. Man, there must be a really steep learning curve involved in ggplot2. No, that's not true. ggplot2 is both, both complicated with fine-grained control, allows you to do many, many things that you would like, exactly the way you would like, and it's also easy to use. It literally will allow you to create print quality graphics in seconds. Now, I know those two things seem to be at odds, but bear with me over the next couple of slides and I'll explain further. Okay, the grammar. So every visualization in ggplot2 is composed of the following things. This is, this is the, the six aspects of the ggplot2 grammar of graphics. Okay, first up, you have the data, which is the raw material for your visualization. Makes total sense. You absolutely have to have data. No data, no visualization. Next up, the other as another aspect of the grammar is what is known as layers. And the easiest way to think about layers is this is what you actually see in your visualization. These are things like the points, the lines, the bars, the whatever, whatever, is on, whatever is on your graphic, whatever is in your visualization, these are the layers. That's what you see. But in order to actually render those layers correctly, you need a scale. Because as you might imagine, if you have a column of data and you have 100,000 values, and they, wild, and they wildly vary in terms of the individual values in each one of the, in the cells in your column, you only have so much real estate on the screen, on the computer screen. So you need something to scale the data down, to map the data to the graphical output so that it makes sense. So the scale is the part of the grammar that actually shrinks or manipulates your data in such a way that it will fit consistently and intelligently on the limited screen real estate that you have on your computer. That's the way to think about scales. Next up, you have coordinates. The coordinates are the visualization's perspective. So for example, the default coordinate system that you use is a two-dimensional grid, an XY plane. Everyone's familiar with this, right? Every time you create a bar chart or a line chart or a histogram, you're on a grid. This is the one used by default, and the vast majority of the time, this is the one you're going to use. But it's not the only coordinate system that you could potentially use, and ggplot supports multiple coordinates. But in general, you tend to use the default, which is a grid. Next up in the grammar, you have faceting. And the easiest way to think about faceting is that it provides visual drill down into the data. And the easiest way to think about this is if you're familiar with Excel, 
you can use what are known as pivot tables in Excel, and they allow you to drill down in your data. And once you get down to a certain level of granularity, right, you've drilled down by this variable and that variable, by this category and that category, so on and so forth, you get a collection of data. And then in Excel 2016, you can actually ask it to create a pivot chart, a visualization based on that drill down. So you focus on a certain subset of the data based on your drill down, and Excel will create for you a chart based on that drill down. Very useful. This is what you use fastening for. This is ggplot's way of mimicking what Excel does with pivot charts. So it's very, very useful, very, very powerful, as we'll see in a bit. And then lastly, we have themes. Themes allows you to do fine, allows you to have fine-grained control over certain details of the display. For example, fonts. What font am I using? What's the size of the font? What's the color schemes that I'm using? That sort of thing. Themes are extremely useful for customizing your visualizations to be uh, to have the look and feel that you desire. So those are the three aspects of the grammar. Now here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. This seems super complicated. I'm sure some of you are saying scales and coordinates and fastening tape what's going on I, I don't i just want to draw i just want to draw a chart why do i need to know all this well the good news is generally speaking working with the grammar you actually don't need to know all of that to get started and the reason for that is most of the time the defaults work well for you out of the box you only need to get to that level of detail if you want to create a more customized graphic if you want to tweak something just so to get just the look that you're interested in you have that power, but most of the time, you're probably not going to be interested in that, and it's okay. ggplot2 will work without you having to, to drill down on that level of detail. So let's talk about what you actually need in practice 20% of the time. Excuse me. What you need to work with the grammar of graphics 80% of the time is you know a small subset. So let's talk about what you absolutely have to have to get a ggplot2 graphic going in your R environment. So not surprisingly, the first thing that you need is the data. Okay, and hopefully enough said. Next up, you need an aesthetic. And an aesthetic essentially is a mapping of your data to the visualization. For example, let's say you're creating a plot, a chart, and you would like the y-axis to essentially be mapped to the ages of the Titanic passengers in your data set. So the y-axis is age and the x-axis is something else. You can actually do that directly in R code using the ggplot2 API. And in fact, you have to do it because you, ggplot2 needs to know how you want the data mapped. Now, once again, if I use Excel as an analogy, this will be this should be intuitive to you because, for example, let's say you're in Excel and you have a worksheet, and on this worksheet you have some data. So you select some cells that have some data in them in your worksheet, and you say, you know what, Excel, please create for me a chart. Now, depending on the nature of the chart that you pick and the nature of the data you select, Excel automatically maps those cells to either the y-axis or the x-axis, depending on the data and the nature of the chart that you pick. You don't have to do it yourself, but you know that that's what's going to happen. And in fact, once the chart's created, you can obviously double-click on it and actually alter the mappings. Say, look, you know what? No, what? I don't want the x-axis to be this, these cells anymore. I want it to actually be the data in these cells now. Same idea. A lot of times in Excel, it automatically does the aesthetic mapping for you. In ggplot2, you still do it. You still have to do it, of course, because it's required. You just have to write a little bit of code to make it happen. And we'll see examples of that later. And then lastly, the only other thing that you need to create a ggplot2 visualization is a layer, which makes sense. If if you don't tell ggplot that you want dots or lines or bars, it doesn't know what to actually display. So you have to provide a layer. So these, these layers, these graphics that you, that you have ggplot render for you, take the function in R code as geom functions, as geom functions. So literally, in the package, there are dozens of functions that all start with the prefix geom, which is sort for geometry geom underscore point, geom underscore bar, geom underscore histogram. These functions actually define the visualization that you actually want ggplot2 to render based on the data that you provide and the aesthetic mappings that you define. So this is actually pretty simple. As we'll see, this is actually very little code to actually require to get a nice visualization going. And we'll see that just a second in the R code. 
Okay, as promised, here the resource, here's the resource that I was mentioning about ggplot2. So the book, ggplot2 by Hadley Wickham, is the single best resource for learning ggplot2, hands down. Because, quite frankly, Hadley Wickham wrote ggplot2. He create, he's the creator of the package, so who better to teach you ggplot2 than the man himself, Mr. Wickham? Another reason why I love this book is because it is a, is a great resource for folks of all levels of skill and experience. And so in my particular case, let me use myself as an example. By the time I bought this book, I actually had quite a bit of experience with ggplot2. I've been using it for a number of years, but most of my experience was just based on trial and error. I learned ggplot2 by hacking it. I Googled things when I ran into problems. I used Stack Overflow, etc. So by the time I bought the book, I actually knew quite a bit about ggplot2, but I still learned a lot by reading it. And what's even better yet is that even if you're an experienced, uh, excuse me, even if you have absolutely no experience in ggplot2, you're an absolute beginner with ggplot2, the book is not too advanced. It, it taught me things, even though I've been using ggplot2 for a number of years, and it can teach folks with no experience in ggplot2. It's great for both types of folks, so I absolutely positively recommend it. If you're only going to buy one resource on ggplot2, this is the book. This is the book to buy. Okay, excellent. So enough with slides. Let's go ahead and actually take a look at the R code now. Okay, so what I've got here is an RStudio environment. And I have the code file, which you can get from the GitHub. I've already set up my RStudio environment to point its working directory where I downloaded the Titanic data from the GitHub repository for this webinar. So it's pointing to the right place on my local hard drive here to actually read in the data. So if you do not have ggplot2, you can highlight this code right here and run it, and that would install ggplot2. R will reach across the internet to a repository, grab the ggplot2 binary, pull it down, install it in your local environment. I already have ggplot2 installed, so I'll just go ahead and load it first thing, because that's what we need to complete this particular video. And, excuse me, this particular webinar. And these lines of code that I have highlighted here will actually load up the CSV data frame, load up the CSV into a data frame, and then it'll actually show us the Titanic data in our studios spreadsheet view using this view function. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so first things that we'll notice is that this data set's not particularly large. It's only 891 observations of 12 columns of data, but as I indicated before, despite its small size, there's actually a lot of goodness packed into this data set, which is why we use it at Data Science Dojo extensively, not only in our meetups and our webinars, but we also use it in our boot camp as well because there's a lot of, lot of good teaching that you can get out of this data set. Okay, so a couple things that I want to point out. First and foremost is that we have two columns here, name and passenger ID, which we did not see in the data dictionary in the PowerPoint slides. So the reason for that is, quite frankly, is they're not particularly useful. You'll notice here the passenger ID is essentially a unique identifier. It basically starts at one and it increases by one for each row in the data. It's just a unique identifier. If you're familiar with databases, this is essentially is the primary key of passengers. Uh, and it's not going to be useful because each individual passenger has a unique ID. So from an analytical perspective, there's not any signal there. Next up, we have name. Like Passenger ID, if you take a look at all the names, there are 891 unique names. No names are duplicated in this data set. So from an analytical perspective, the names in their current form aren't very useful. There's no, there's no analytical signal in this data. Now, you might imagine that if we decided to use some regular expressions or some text analytics on this data, we could probably get some signal out of it, and that's absolutely true. However, that's beyond the scope of today's webinar. So as a consequence, we're just going to ignore passenger ID and we're going to ignore name. So next up, the second thing that I wanted, wanted to show you in this, data, in this data set is the importance of recognizing the categorical variables and making sure that we assign those variables explicitly to be categories. And let me use survived in p-class as the primary examples. So as we know from the data dictionary slide, survived is a binary indicator. It is zero if the passenger perished, and it's one if they survived. 
But by default, it, when we read this data in from the CSV, R, R is going to interpret survived as being a numeric column. Because as far as it's concerned, it's a bunch of integer values. But we know as the data professional, as the data scientist, that in fact survived shouldn't be a numeric column because it's actually not going to be used in any sort of mathematical context. For example, we would never do multiplication and division on the survived column. It makes no sense to divide values and survived by themselves or multiply them together or anything like that. We wouldn't do math like that. Ergo, survived really isn't what is known as ratio data. It's not really numeric. We're not going to use it for any sort of numeric calculations. So that's an indication to us that it should probably be a factor. It should be a categorical variable. Either you survived or you didn't, essentially. In a similar fashion, we can analyze P-class. So P-class has three, ver three values, one, two, and three. And again, we can apply our heuristic of saying, would we do multiplication or division on P-class data? And the answer is no. It doesn't make any sense to do that. Third class cannot be interpreted, P class of three, cannot be interpreted as being three times a P class of one. Not really. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Reflexively, you cannot think of a P class of one as being one third of a P class of three. It doesn't make sense. This is not ratio data. Therefore, it also makes sense for P class to also be a factor, to be a category in our terms. Lastly, we should also be looking at uh, our sex column as being a factor, obviously, because it's string data and there's only two values, male and female. Those are the categories. And we also have embarked. Notice that we have our string, um, our individual character data here of S, C, and Q. These are distinct values. You're either, you either are on the ship in Southampton or Cherbourg or Queenstown. So we should probably make this a factor as well. Well, I'm in here, one quick thing I should also point out. Notice in the age column, we're missing data. We're missing data in the age column here. That's going to be important later. ggplot2 will um, accommodate this, and we should take a look at it just so that we're aware of what um, ggplot does in the situation where we try to create graphics, visualizations on columns where some data is missing. Okay, so there's our data. So obviously, next up, we're going to go ahead and set all of these variables that should be factors as factors. So I'm just going to run, run this code, and good to go. Now, the reason why this is important is because ggplot2 is smart. ggplot2 is smart. In certain aspects of how you code up visualizations in ggplot2, if you provide it, factor variables as part of the visualization, as part of the aesthetic, as part of the mapping, it will do cool and interesting things. As we'll see in a bit, we can actually use factor variables to actually color code our visualizations and really make them pop in terms of the information that they can portray. Okay, cool. So we've got our data prepped and we're good to go. So going back to our scenario, we're a consulting data scientist. We've been hired by a company to analyze the Titanic data and understand the underlying signal in the data. Explain to me based on the data, the story of who survives and who doesn't in the Titanic. Okay, cool. So not surprisingly, since maybe we're not super familiar with the Titanic data set and we're consulting data scientists, the first thing we may want to know is, in general, what was the survival rate? We've, this is the first time we've looked at the data. We should probably actually understand what is survival rates. So we can do that pretty easily with just this small amount of code. Now notice how this mimics the last slide that we talked about in the deck, the last slide about ggplot2 specifically that we talked about in the deck, that you only need three things. First up, you need your data. Please ggplot2, work with the Titanic data. Next up, we need an aesthetic. And in particular, we're saying, hey, ggplot2, map the x-axis to the survived column of the Titanic data set. And then lastly, we need a layer. And here we're saying, please use geom underscore bar, which actually translates in ggplot2 to a bar chart. A bar chart is an excellent thing to use for categorical data because essentially a bar chart is just a count. And since categorical data can't be thought of in terms of more advanced mathematical operations like multiplication and division, basically the only thing you can do is talk about factor and categorical variables in terms of counts. Okay. 
As always, let's go ahead and use the help system here. So first up, let's do a quick help find on the ggplot function itself. And notice here that it says, okay, ggplot2, create a new ggplot. Excellent, that makes a lot of sense to us. Good. Next up, we can look up the AES function. So let's do question mark AES and enter. And you can see here, construct aesthetic mappings. So all that makes a lot of sense. How we can interpret this code is, this is the foundation. ggplot, I want to start building a new visualization. Here's the data I want you to use. Here's the aesthetic mapping. Map the x-axis to the survived column of the Titanic data frame. And then lastly, layer on a bar chart. And as I mentioned before, we can type in down here in the command line, if we un type in under gm underscore, notice how many entries we get. Look at all of these functions, all of these functions, many, many functions. We can do a violin plot, we can put in text, we can do ribbons and we can do polygons, we can do histograms, all kinds of things. Many, many visualizations are possible and they all start with geom. And when you see geom underscore, you know that you're talking about a very specific type of visualization, a very specific type of chart or plot. So this is a bar chart. Okay, so let's highlight these two lines of code and run them. And I'll clear out this code down here because we don't need it anymore. And I'll zoom in and take a look at this. Very easily, we have a print quality graphic, a print quality visualization. And you'll notice that along the x-axis, we have survived, zero for those folks that perished on the Titanic, and a one for those people that survived. And notice right away, we can tell that more people perished and survived, unfortunately, on the Titanic. And we can also kind of estimate, you know, relative proportions here as well. So we have about 550 people out of 891 perished, and about 340, let's say, people or so that survived. And we just look at this from this chart. Now, a question that I get, is, get asked often is, Dave, what if I actually want to place on these on these charts the actual percentages just because I, I don't want to eyeball it I actually just want to know what the percentages are you can absolutely do that unfortunately the the code that you need is a little bit more advanced than we have time to talk about in this particular video but regardless what I advise people to do when they're first starting out with ggplot2 and they want to know about relative percentages don't bother putting them on the plots per se at least to start with just use this type of R syntax here prop.table feed into it the results of the table command, and if I run this highlighted line of code, I get the relative percentages. About 62% of the passengers, unfortunately, perished on the Titanic, and about 38% survived. And if you go back here and look at the graphic, yeah, you can roughly kind of eyeball and say, yeah, that seems, seems about right. Seems about right. Okay. So moving on. So this, so this is, this graphic is, is, is print quality, but it's probably not customized enough to actually print. So let's add a little bit of, of ggplot2 code to actually improve this a little bit. So one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to improve this label. Notice how it's just count. We're gonna change this to make it something a little more intuitive. And notice that the title, there's no title for this plot, so we'll actually add a title for this plot. So notice that the first thing that I can do is I can just copy this code and then paste it and then add some add some items to it. And that's exactly what I did. And this is a cornerstone of an R developer, an R programmer's productivity using ggplot2. There's a lot of what is known as copy and paste reuse. Because notice that this line of code right here is exactly the same as this line of code right here. Notice that this line of code right here is exactly the same as this line of code right here. So I copy and pasted it, and I just added some, some stuff. The stuff that I added was a theme, which we'll talk about in a second, and I added a call to the labs function. And as always, you can use the help system, question mark labs, modify the axis legend and plot labels. So this is a function that I can use to change the label on the y-axis, and this is a function that I can use to set the title of my plot. Now, getting back to the theme, you'll notice here that 
the default background that you get in ggplot2 is this gray. This is the default background that you get. For me personally, I don't like the gray, just my own personal opinion. I like a nice clean background. I like it to be white. So this theme actually defines a white background instead of a gray background. So I like to use it. So that's what I commonly have in my ggplots. So if I highlight all this code and I run it, you can now see our modified visualization. And notice here that we get a nice passenger count label here on the y-axis. We get a new title called Titanic Survival Rates and a nice white background. So this is actually a print quality graphic. You could actually submit this to, for example, an academic journal for a publication. Very easy, very quick and easy to do. All right, moving on. So we're the consulting data scientist. We have an understanding of the relative proportion of survival now between, between those who survived and those who didn't. So the next question we can ask ourselves is, well, what's a working hypothesis for this data? If you're familiar, familiar with the nautical space, there is a popular adage that essentially says women and children first. So being relatively new to the space, let's say, as this, as this consulting data scientist, we assume, hey, that's a reasonable hypothesis to explore. Can I actually use ggplot2 to answer the question, what was the survival rate by gender? And that's actually relatively easy. Notice that once again, I can take this copy and paste reuse from the previous visualization and just modify it a little bit for it to work now to answer this question. And the two things that I needed to change to answer this question, well, technically the three things that I needed to change are, first of all, I mapped the x-axis now to sex. Instead of it being survived as it was in the previous plot, I now map the x-axis to sex. And then I add something called fill. And I mentioned this earlier. If you provide fill as part of your aesthetic mapping to ggplot2 and you assign to it a categorical variable, what you get is a nice color coding. Many, many of the geoms of the layers in ggplot2 have the ability to be filled, to be color coded with a fill rate. And what this does essentially is says, look, each of my bars will now be filled based on a value, uh, the value of survived, whether it was zero or one, and fill the bar up proportional to the counts that you get. And this allows you to essentially get a bar chart that will show you the relative proportions of those who lived and who died by the sex variable, by gender. And, and the third thing that I need to change, obviously, is I just need to update the, the title here to make it correct. So if I highlight all of this code and run it, look at that. Nice. This really pops. This really pops. I can just make this a little bit bigger. And you can see here, as we would expect, sex is along the horizontal here, along the x-axis. I have females and males. And notice how much information I get out of this. First up, obviously, I have color coding. Survived. This orange, orangish color here indicates somebody, a passenger of that Titanic did not make it, they perished. And this green or teal color actually denotes that they in fact survived. And the first thing that you notice obviously is this big orange colored block right here, which says, look, most males did not survive on the Titanic. Most males did not survive on the Titanic. The other thing that probably grabbed your attention was this big teal colored box, which shows you that most females on the Titanic survived. So what this tells you is a couple of different things. First up, females survived disproportionately more than males did on the Titanic. And also, it tells you that there were a lot more males on the Titanic to begin with than there were females, approximately a two to one ratio, twice as many males approximately than there were females. So this is a great visualization. Notice how, from a storytelling perspective, this is extremely intuitive and very easy to, to talk to non-data savvy professionals about because the nature of the human brain, we understand visualizations intuitively. We understand proportions intuitively. So this, this is actually a very, very great way of telling your story. Okay, cool. So there seems to be some, cre some, some uh, this visualization gives some credence to our hypothesis of women and children first. Females disproportionately survived compared to males. Okay, so moving on, we can say, okay, so gender seems to be important. I can tell the story of 
if you were a female on the Titanic, odds are that you survived based on the data that we have. And if you were a male on the Titanic, odds are that you did not make it. But we may, we, we may need to understand additional factors that may have influenced this, right? That, that's, a, that's a useful understanding of what's going on in the data. Females disproportionately survived. Males disproportionately did not survive. But what other factors within the ranks of the females, within the ranks of the males, actually dis, may have decided whether or not or were indicative of whether or not you survived? So one hypothesis that we could formulate was, well, in addition to gender, maybe the class of your ticket also played a role. Because here's the intuition. If you were in first class, you were higher up on the ship. First class cabins were higher on the higher decks. Those decks were closer to the lifeboats. So maybe if you were in first class or second class, you had a better chance of survival because you were just closer to the, the lifeboats. A more pessimistic interpretation would also be is that, you know, wealthier people had a tendency to survive, but that may have just been a function of their proximity to the, the lifeboats rather than any sort of discrimination going on at the time. Okay, so how can we do that? Very simply, we can go ahead and just use our copy and paste reuse again. We copy and paste the previous visualization, and all we need to change are two things. The x-axis is not going to be sex anymore. It will now be p-class. And then we just update the, the update the title to reflect the fact that we're now talking about P class instead of sex as one of our pivots. And again, uh, and I want to stress this enough. I can't stress this enough. You're actually pretty productive with ggplot2 because of this copy and paste reuse technique. I mean, it literally only takes you seconds to run through a whole bunch of visualizations because essentially you type out the first one in your R code. And after that, it's just a bunch of copy and pasting and tweaking. So um, as many folks know, I do have experience with tools like Tableau. I do have experience with tools like Power BI and creating graphics in Excel. But I use R almost exclusively for all my data visualization. And the reason for that is I have fine-grained control over my visualizations because of the grammar of graphics. And actually, in many cases, I can create my visualizations faster in R than I can in a visualization tool. Not because I'm some sort of super R coder, but because of this copy and paste reuse mechanic that I use. And it doesn't make me special. Everybody can do it. Just take some practice. Okay. All right. So notice that we now have a new visualization here where we have our survival rates based on relative, uh, our relative survival rates based on P class. So notice down here on the horizontal axis, we have first class, second class, and third class. And a couple of things pop right away out of this visualization. First and foremost, obviously on the right, not surprisingly, unfortunately, folks in third class had pretty poor survival rates, maybe a three to one ratio. So maybe only one in four passengers survived about approximately. And in first class, reflexively, more than half survived. Now, what's also interesting is, as depicted in this visualization, is the relative count of overall passengers based on class. It wouldn't, it, I think it would be intuitive to assume that the least amount of passengers would be in first class because those are the most expensive tickets. But you would think that second class passengers would actually be more than first class, but less than third class. They'd be kind of in, in between. But what we actually see here was, in fact, there were less second class passengers than either first or third, which may be very interesting depending on uh, the nature of the analysis that you're conducting. But notice, though, despite the differences in relative passenger counts, the intuition that you have declining rates of survival as you move down the ship from first class to the bottom of the ship or towards the bottom of the ship in third class, that holds up. So you have more than 50% survival in first class, approximately eyeballing the data about 50% survival in second class, and only maybe about 25% survival in third class. So that matches our intuition, which is well, maybe, maybe being higher up in the ship, being closer to the lifeboats, gave you a better chance of survival than if you were deep in the bowels of the ship in third class, for example. Okay. So not surprisingly, we're intrepid consulting data scientists. So we say, okay, look, you know what? 
gender seems to be a factor in determining whether or not you survived. The class of the ticket that you have seems to be a determinant or a factor in whether or not you survived. What about if I combine both of those things at the same time? What if I do a visual drill down on both P class and sex at the same time? Will I see an even cleaner pattern in the data? Will the, will the data tell me an even richer story about what's going on with passengers on the Titanic? So now surprisingly, we can do exactly that in ggplot2 because as we saw on a previous slide, ggplot2 has this concept of fastening. So the function in, in ggplot2 that you can use, and there are two of them, one is called facet underscore grid, and the other is the one I'm using here, which is facet underscore wrap. Faceting is the mechanism by which we can do this visual drill down. So let's, let's parse this code real quick. And notice once again, though, that most of it, I use copy and paste reuse to actually generate, and then I just tweaked what I needed. So ggplot2, start with the Titanic data, map the x-axis to sex. I would like you to fill based on survived. And again, I'm going to create a bar chart. But here's the thing. I want you to also facet the data. I want you to drill down on the data. And in particular, I would like you to drill down based on p-class. Now, how to read this syntax in here is actually quite simple. So this little squiggly line, this tilde, the easiest way to think about this particular piece of the syntax is to think of it as in terms of by. ggplot please facet the Titanic data by p-class. Okay, let's see how it visualizes and then you'll see what I mean, how you interpret that, um, that facet wrap code. So if I zoom in on that visualization here, and let's go ahead and expand it so that you can see it a little bit better. Notice exactly what I was talking about earlier. So I have a panel for first class here. Notice this box is the panel second class and third class, and then with each panel, I have females and males only in first class, females and males only in second class, females and males only in third class, and now I have my nice color-coded bar charts. Once again, this orange color means uh, that the, the passenger perished, and this green teal actually means that they survived. Okay, so based on that, we can see a couple things that pop out of this in particular. First and foremost, what we see here is that females in first class overwhelmingly survived. They overwhelmingly survived. Also, what we can see here is that females in second class also overwhelmingly survived. And in third class, females had about a 50-50 split. But if you look at the males, we have a, 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 a a sadder story, which is essentially, you know, females disproportionately survived all up. Um, even in third class, they had a 50-50 chance, but across the board, males had much lower survival rates, much lower survival rates. Now, proportionally speaking, it looks like, not surprisingly, males in first class had the highest levels of survivability, and in, may in second class, mm, probably a bit higher than third class, but not by a lot, and in most likely in third class, the least chance of survival. So this is super interesting. And also notice, though, too, something else that pops out at this. The relative proportion of male of females to males based on class. Now notice that the ratios between males and females are actually far closer in first and second class than they are in third class. There are way more males in third class than there are females. Way more. This is potentially interesting and also something that may be worthy of further investigation as you drill into the data. But for our purposes right now, we'll just say, okay, look, this is interesting, but not necessarily germane to the task at hand, which is understanding um, survivability. Okay, now so far, we've focused only on the factor variables. We focused on p-class, we focused on sex, and we focused on survived. And we were able to create some really good and useful and powerful visualizations, but if we go back to our original hypothesis of women and children first, one of the things we also need to take a look at is age. Because gender is one aspect of women and children first, and age is the other aspect of women and children first. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, so 
There are a number of visualizations that we can use in ggplot2 that specifically work really well for numeric data, for continuous data. First up is the histogram. So not surprisingly, one of the things we're probably going to want to know at the beginning when we start looking at ages in the Titanic is, okay, what is the age distribution of passengers all up? And we use a histogram to actually understand that. So not surprisingly, we're going to have a geom here, underscore geom underscore histogram, which actually is the layer corresponding to a histogram. We map the x-axis to our values for age. But the single most important thing that we need to, to see in this code is this part right here, which is bin width. As, as you're aware, as I assume that you're aware, uh, histograms, their shape, their visual shape will actually change based on uh, how you define the bin width. What this bin width says right now is, please bin my age data into blocks of five years. For example, block everybody from uh, you know, 0 to 5, 6 through 10, 11 through 15, 16 through 20, so on and so forth, and the bins. So I want bins that are five years wide in five-year increments. Now, obviously, if I made this bin with 10 years, the plot would look different. If I made it one year, the plot would look different. So by default, ggplot2 will pick a bin width for you, but it, usually it is not optimal. So you actually want to spend some time visualizing your data with various bin widths and finding which one actually is the most reasonable based on the nature of your data. So I've already done this before the webinar, and a bin width of five years actually works pretty well. So that's what we'll use here. So let's go ahead and run all this code and take a look at the visualization. Now notice, as I mentioned earlier, we know that we have missing data in the age column. And specifically, the output here says, look, you know what, Dave, you asked me to plot the age column, and there were 177 missing values. There were 177 missing values. That's cool, right? So ggplot2 said, fine, I'll remove the 177 missing values. I will create you a histogram with the remaining values that I do have, and it also provides me a warning message. And that's important because later on, as a data scientist, I may actually have to do something about those ages, either remove those rows or try to impute the missing ages, what have you. But for right now, for our purposes, we can just ignore that. Just notice that, that ggplot2 will automatically remove, if necessary, missing values and create you the plot with the data that you do have. So let's go ahead and zoom in on that. And you can see here a nice, nice plot. Now, not surprisingly, you'll notice that we have a long tail here out to the right long tail out here to the right. And that's because, not surprisingly, you know, older passengers weren't that prevalent. Now, even in, even in the modern times of, of today, generally speaking, you have a long tail out to the right age-wise, but it's especially pronounced on the Titanic because, of course, in the early 1900s, uh, longevity was actually, life expectancy was actually lower than it is now. So this is actually pretty interesting. Notice that there were folks as, as old as 80 on the Titanic. Uh, another thing to also note is that, in fact, there were some children. So one of the first things that we want to check out is if we have a hypothesis of women and children first, we should confirm, in fact, there were children on the ship. And what this plot shows us is, in fact, yes, there were some children on the ship. Not a lot, proportionately, but there were some. And the last thing that's super interesting is if you look at this range between 20 and 40, there's a huge chunk of the data, a huge chunk of the passengers in terms of numbers fall in this range of 20 and 40. And then you have this long tail out to the right for old folks older than that, and very few people younger than that. The bulk of the people look like to be in this range of 20 to 40. Okay, this is super interesting. But the good news is, is that we can act, as, as, in, as, as useful as this plot is, as informative as this graphic is, this visualization is, we can actually improve it relatively easy. And not surprisingly, we can do that by adding fill. Histograms in ggplot2 actually support the fill command, so we can actually color code each one of the bars in the histogram to illustrate the relative proportion of those who lived and died based on the age buckets. In, in this particular visualization, our age buckets are five years wide. So let's just go ahead and run this code, and I can show you what I mean. Notice once again that it tells us that we're missing 177 values, which is nice. 
Now this is a great visualization. So we have the age distribution as we saw before, but now notice that it's providing us a lot more information because it's showing us the relative proportion of those who perished versus those who survived at each bucket, at each bin. So for example, we can see here that children, you know, this particular bucket of ages, this particular bucket of ages, children, especially at the younger end, disproportionately survived. More than half survived here, more than half survived here. So that provides some credence, provides some more additional information that says, look, the hypothesis of women and children first may actually have a lot of applicability in this data set. Now also notice reflexively that at the high end of the spectrum, survivability is actually quite low, starting probably um, you know, right around here. So this is 50, so say maybe 52-ish, 53-ish. Notice how much orange there is versus how much teal there is. With the one outlier of apparently there was one 80-year-old person out here, and they actually survived. But in general, as you might expect, it seems like you know, the older you get, mm, you know, not so good from a survivability perspective. And then once again, you notice here in the middle between 20 and 40, uh, it seems to be, generally speaking, in some cases it's around 50-50. In some cases, it's actually less than 50-50, depending on your ages. Okay, so this is a really, really useful plot. It tells you a lot. Once again, notice how you can use this in storytelling to non-data savvy uh, audiences, and they can relatively intuitively understand what's going on. Okay, but histograms are not the only thing that you can use to understand what's going on in numeric data. You can also use what's known as a box and whisker plot. So let's just go ahead and throw up the code here real quick. Excuse me, let's throw up the visualization real quick based on the code. And then we can go ahead and use the visualization to understand the code. Now notice that I've got my survived along the x-axis, which you can see here in the code, x equals survived. And on the y-axis, this is new. We haven't actually explicitly plot anything on the y-axis yet, but for the box and whisker plot, you have to actually provide a y-axis. And notice that we've said, okay, we want the x-axis to be survived, and we want the y-axis to be age. And then what we get, essentially, is the age distribution all up of zero, that is those who perished, and one, those who survived. And notice that the story that this visualization tells us is, in general, people who survived tended to be younger than those who perished, but only by a little bit, because notice that this box is only a little bit lower than this box. This line here is a little bit lower than this line. This line here is a little bit lower than this line, so on and so forth. You'll notice that all this is telling you is that, in general, people who survived tended to be younger. Now this visualization is super useful, but the reason why I showed it second in the script is because I wanted to show you the previous visualization, which unequivocally demonstrated that not only did people who survived tend to be younger, but if you were extremely young, i.e. if you were children, you actually disproportionately survived. You don't actually necessarily get this inf that level of information from this particular plot, but notice that it also is useful. It tells a story. But I use both of these visualizations to reinforce this idea that you want to take multiple looks at the data. You want to use multiple visualization tools to actually get a more thorough, if you will, 360 degree view of what's going on in the data. So box and whisker plot, extremely useful, but don't use it just by itself. You need, to, you need some other visualizations as well to truly understand what's going on in the data. Okay, moving on. So not surprisingly, hey, if if it's good to segment, if it's good to drill down on our data based on both gender and class of ticket for survivability, hey, why well, let's do the same thing with age. And of course, not surprisingly, we can do that with ggplot2. So notice that this code right here is going to go ahead and drill down on ages. We have age mapped to the x-axis. Notice once again that we're filling based on survive, so we want to color code the bars based on survived. But notice now that I've added to the facet wrap both sex and p-class. Sex and p-class. So notice I'm actually getting a four-dimensional view. I'm looking at four pieces of, of data at the same time to try and understand the signal. I'm looking at age, 
as segmented by both sex and P class, and I'm also seeing the relative survival rate for ages based on the combination of sex and P class. Now, what I'm going to illustrate here is what's known as a density plot. So let's just go ahead and run the code, and let's take a look at the visualization. Because understanding a density plot is much easier if you just look at it. Okay. Density plots are analogous to histograms, but they are smoothed out. Notice how I've got these neat, nice smooth shapes, whereas you know uh, histograms are essentially jaggy because they're just essentially just bars, squared off bars. The, the information that's portrayed is essentially the same, but depending on the audience, they may find histograms a little difficult to read, maybe a bit in, intimidating. Almost everybody can take a look at uh, density plots and understand what's going on. So you'll notice here in the code, I've asked to create a, a geom density, which is a density plot, and I've specified an alpha value of 0 0.5. If you're not familiar with alpha, that essentially sets the transparency. Notice how I have these nice transparent things where I can see through. If, my alpha, if I didn't set alpha, these would be opaque. So one would block the other. So using an alpha allows you this nice transparency so you can actually see these blended figures together and you can see where they overlap and where they don't. But notice what this density plot shows, which is super interesting, super interesting. Notice that it expands upon our idea of women and children first. And it really calls out in, in a very clear way that depending on the P class, children disproportionately survived. For example, look at second class. So notice we have females across the top, males across the bottom, first class, second class, third class, first class, second class, third class. And if you notice the second class column here, that this green color, which is our, our teal color, which indicates survival, overwhelmingly shows that the youngest children in both girls and boys survive in second class. It also shows that boys in first class disproportionately survived, and it also shows that if you were a boy in third class, you may have, in some cases, greater than a 50-50 chance, not by much, but greater than 50-50 chance of actually surviving. So this actually shows you a lot of information about what's going on says, look, you know what, not only does age matter, but the combination of age and gender and P-class matters. Because notice that girls in third class don't actually have nearly the same level of survivability as boys in third class. So yes, age matters, but it's not age in isolation. It's the combination of age and gender and P-class actually is a pretty powerful signal. And notice once again, how much of the story just pops out at you without any sort of data savvy um, skill or knowledge required to understand what's going on in the data. You say, oh, yeah, look at that. Obviously, young, young males, boys in second class, they all seem to survive. Very useful. Now, if you don't like the density plot, no problem. We can essentially do the same thing using histograms instead. So I won't drain this code because essentially the only thing we changed was this part right here, and we've seen it before. So if I highlight this code and I run it, there you have it. Once again, let's go ahead and drill in. This is also, the density plot is great, but I also like this one a lot too. And in fact, I would encourage you, use both. Why, why choose? Use both. I mean, look at, look at the data that just pops here. So if I look at this, look at the females here, just the top row are all females. Look at this. There's only three, three females in first class that perish. Oddly enough, one that perished was a girl. That's unexpected based on what we've seen elsewhere in the data. But notice that the overwhelming number of females survive in first class. Same thing in second class. But notice that all, all of the girls in second class survive. But also note here, it lo actually looks like, oh, you know what? Maybe actually our density plot didn't, a very, didn't do us a very good job actually communicating what's going on in the data because actually girls in third class also disproportionately survived. Maybe actually not as much as we initially thought as boys in third class, because obviously, so this line right here is 10, so this is everyone that's under 10. So yeah, it looks like especially young girls in particular disproportionately survived, maybe even at higher rates than boys, which is interesting. 
And then looking at the rest of the boys, all the boys in second class survived, all the boys in first class survived. But also notice too that you can see here, this is very pronounced, very pronounced, that as you get older in third class, oof, survival rates are really, really bad, which tells us that, look, uh, well, in general, survival rates for, adult, for elderly males is pretty bad all up. So free males, eh, mixed bag, but definitely speaking, older males, not so good, especially in third class. Look at all this orange. Look at all this orange. Okay, there you have it. So this concludes the R portion of the webinar today. Hopefully the tools and techniques that we've illustrated today are going to be useful for you in your daily work, and hopefully they got you super excited about the possibilities of using ggplot2 in your daily work. So now I will go ahead and turn it over to our illustrious marketing manager to talk to you about our poll. So thank you again to David and thank you to everybody for joining. If you want more tutorials and content like this, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can also find more tutorials like this available on our Data Science Dojo YouTube channel. And you can listen to what our past students have to say about our bootcamp if you follow datasciencedojo.com reviews. So again, thank you to everyone for watching and we'll see you next time. Have a great day.